Area 941 podcast are produced and distributed by Community Power 94.1 KPFA Radio. Please help support Area 941 at kpfa.org. I'm C.S. Song, KPFA's associate theater critic, and my guest in studio is Tom Ross. He's the artistic director of Aurora Theater Company in Berkeley, and he directs the Aurora's current production of a play called Luna Gale, now on stage through October 1st. Tom, thanks for joining me. Thank you, C.S. It's great to be here. What do you feel comfortable telling us about the narrative line, the plot line of this play, Luna Gale? Yes. I, I was actually speaking to a group yesterday, and uh, half of them had seen the play and half of them hadn't. And I was told I could not give away any spoilers. <laughs> so I've got some practice with that. Um, this is a play written by Rebecca Gilman. It was uh, premiered in Chicago at the Goodman Theater about three years ago. I'm a big fan of Rebecca Gilman's work. I first learned of her uh, in 1999. She wrote a play called Spinning into Butter, which was one of the most produced plays of that year. It was up for the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, it was made into a movie starring Sarah Jessica Parker, and it was about a small liberal arts college and racism. And so that sort of put her on the map as a very brave playwright who likes to write about contemporary issues. And anyway, so when I heard that she had written a new play called Luna Gale, uh, I instantly got a copy of it. I read it. I instantly wanted to direct it. Uh, and But it took us three years to get the rights to the play. Uh, it's Like I said, it was at the Goodman Theater in Chicago, which is like the ACT of Chicago. It was at the Kirk Douglas Theater in Los Angeles. Les Waters directed it in Louisville. So it's a, it's a big play. I, it's a, I should say an important play. And what it's about is, was your question, uh, Luna Gale is the name of a six-month-old child whose parents are meth addicts. And uh, as the play starts, the parents are in an emergency room in a hospital in Iowa, uh, waiting to hear about the health of their baby because their baby was dehydrated and they had to take it to the emergency room. And while they are there, they are greeted with a character named Caroline, who's the protagonist of the play, and she is a social worker. And the um, basic plot of the play, which I think I can give away, is that the social worker's job, of course, is to, it's a monumental job that they have, but it's to try to reconcile a child with their parents if possible. And in the interim, while they're trying to get clean or whatever, to put that baby in a foster home or in kin care, which is preferred, which is with a relative. And it seems like the logical place for her to put this baby is with the baby's grandmother. But what Caroline discovers uh, in the end of the second scene, uh, and then more so as the play progresses, because we keep learning more and more and more about these characters, is that the mother is an evangelical Christian who believes in end days and wants to make sure the baby is saved before that occurs. So the beginning dilemma of the play is what's better for this child to be reconciled with its parents, who are currently meth addicts, uh, one has a job, one does not, or with this wonderful seeming woman in her beautiful suburban home, but is an evangelical Christian. What motivated the playwright Rebecca Gilman to, to write this play? Yeah, well, she's been very open about that, which I think is really exciting, and I, I put some information about that in the program. Originally, she saw two PBS frontline specials on social workers in Maine, and they are actually both available. They're on YouTube, and I watched them, and everybody in the cast watched them, and we learned a lot. The first one is rather sensational. It is about a social worker that eventually adopts a child that she was trying to place, and that child dies in a mysterious way. This is all true, and it's very sensational. And it was so sensational that the Human Services Department of Maine decided to give them another opportunity to actually follow social workers, another group, for a month. I think it was a month to really see how, how they operate and how, how it really works in a less sensational way. And uh, what you learn, I mean, outside of the fact that these people are dealing with life and death family situations, but a lot of these people are like kids are like right out of college, and they've had very little... Uh, experience in life themselves that they're trying to deal with 25 caseloads of, of family problems. So anyway, she saw, Rebecca saw these two documentaries. I knew she wanted to write a play about social workers, couldn't come up with the plot. And then she was, I believe, in Oregon, and she was in an emergency room uh, in a hospital, and she realized that some of the people she was in the emergency room with were meth addicts. 
and really messed up. But when one of the women's phone rang and she started talking about her daughter and worried about her daughter's welfare and what kind of formula they were feeding the daughter, et cetera, Rebecca Gilman suddenly thought, could this person be a meth addict and still be a wonderful mother? And that started giving her the plot for the play. And what are some of the themes about the nature and current state of the foster care system, in addition to what you've already mentioned, that are are brought up, that are explored in this play? One certainly is the uh, the amount of pressure and overload that the workers are under. They're underfunded, underpaid. Caroline, in our play, uh, I believe she has 20, uh, 90 cases that she's working on. This group I was speaking to yesterday, there were a number of retired social workers there who had seen the play, and they were struck by how researched and realistic the play was to their own lives. And one of the things that they brought up, which is also brought up in Luna Gale, is there's a character named Lourdes who has been in the system for her entire life, going from one home to another. And when you're 18 years old, you're emancipated and you graduate out of the system. And um, we follow this in, in Luna Gale. But they were saying that that's really an amazing tragedy of all these kids that graduate the system. They've never really had a family. They don't really have support and how their lives go terribly awry after they leave the system. And what can we learn from this play? What have you learned from this play about how much Rebecca Gilliman, who again is the writer, the author of this play, Luna Gale, at Aurora Theatre Company, to what extent she strives to put people who are on the margins, people who are often looked down upon, at the center of her works? I'm I'm from the Midwest, from suburbs of Chicago. So I like to champion plays about Midwesterners because so many plays, American plays, are written about New Yorkers or people that live in California, it seems like. And they are, uh, they're very underrepresented. Uh, I did a play called uh, Bright New Boise a few seasons ago, which was about people who work in a Hobby Lobby store uh, in Boise. And the lead character of that was an evangelical Christian. Now, I'm not an evangelical Christian, but I think religion is certainly an uh, important force in the world. I think it's it's a topic that should be discussed and can be discussed in the, in the theatrical settings. So that was one thing about this play that I found interesting um, was the critic and, and also the audiences just go crazy about Berkeley audiences are getting very vocal about some things that happened in this play. I'm not going to give it away. It's a spoiler. But there are people literally standing up yelling at characters saying, don't do it, don't do it, <laughs> wow. don't do it. Tom Ross joins me in studio. He directs the current Aurora Theatre Company production of Luna Gale. It's a play by Rebecca Gilman. It runs through October 1st. Aurora Theatre Company is located at 2081 Addison Street near Shattuck in downtown Berkeley. Tom is the artistic director of Aurora Theatre Company, which he inaugurated with Barbara Oliver back in 1992. And I'm C.S. Song. There are a series of very impactful moments in this play, moments that caught me by surprise and made me question assumptions that I had formed in my own mind about this character or that. How skillful is the playwright in crafting these moments, and how do you, as the director, approach them in the sense of, you know, trying to bring out the surprise or the emotional impact in a way that you think the play demands? Yeah, I... um. As we've been talking about the play, I realize I'm making it sound like this play is very dark and it's a lot of work and it's a heavy load, when actually it's a hopeful play. Um, There's humor in it. And I felt reading it that in some ways it felt like a, it almost felt like a law and order episode or something like that. I felt like Caroline, the the social worker, is, is like a detective in this play. And she's moving from scene to scene to scene, gathering information. That's what social workers do a lot as well. Like in the f- first scene, in, in, as she visits the grandmother, um, she's opening up the grandmother's refrigerator to see what sort of food she has in there. She's picking up the bottles of, of medicine that are on the counter, making notes about things. And she's trying to get information about secrets in the family or this, that, and the other. <clears throat> so with the actors, what we try to do sometimes is we try to create an expectation that we know is not going to happen. So to sell something in one way, knowing that you're going to be surprised when you find out that that's not exactly true. I mean, that that's certainly in the writing. 
but it is something that as a director, I work with my actors on also creating this illusion. Like you think a scene's going to go one way, it's heading in one direction, and suddenly we just pull the rug out from the audience. You're going, oh. A number of people have referred to this play that it sort of reminds them of Rochamon in some ways, which I don't exactly see, but I also do see in some ways in that everybody's side of the story is different than the other person's side of the story. And you have to keep putting these puzzle pieces together to finally come to the truth. There's a, a lot of talking in this play. There's also a lot of listening. And at one point, Cindy, who is the baby's grandmother, she, Cindy, is silent for an extended period while she hears another character tell a story. Now, you know, in the way that Cindy listens and reacts silently, so much is conveyed or was conveyed to me. And so how do you coach an actor to listen and react silently in a way that, that has maximum impact on the stage? Well, all of my actors are very invested in this play. Um, we did our very first read-through where the actors met each other for the first time and <clears throat> we heard the play out loud. They were in tears by the end of the play, so many of them. Sometimes I've been telling some of the actors, like, you know, chill out a little bit because you're going to psychically damage yourself by the end of this run. Mm. Um, on that particular scene you're talking about, one thing I did was I, it's, it's a mon, uh, she's listening to a monologue by another character, and I have both of them facing out, directly out, facing the audience, not facing each other, because I wanted the audience to really be seeing Sydney's face and seeing exactly what was going through her mind. Uh, one of the things I love about Aurora, I always say, is that why the space is so special to me is that I can watch an actor think on stage. I can watch thoughts cross their mind. And there are a number of moments in this particular production where I think different actors do that at different times. Um, Laura Jane Bailey, who plays Cindy, the grandmother, she's a wonderful actress. She's also from the Midwest, so she likes supporting the Midwest. I don't know if I had to coach her actually all that much. Both she and Devin, who is the young man who's giving her the monologue, they both were pretty much spot on about that. And I just, I just like coach them just a little bit or say slow something down a little bit or don't be crying. I think actors crying on stage is usually pretty boring. So I, I think it's more dramatic and interesting to watch someone who's trying not to cry hmm. than who actually cries. So I try to do that. Um, there is a scene which we well, I don't want to give away, which Jamie Jones is also facing directly down at the audience. And there are so many thoughts that are going through her head. And Jamie's just an extraordinary actor. And uh, I didn't really tell her what to be thinking, but I told her that she should really be thinking strongly. And I really wanted to see, uh, see her fighting back tears. That's another little scene, I think, where we're thinking that we're hoping that the audience is thinks, will think that that character is going to go one way. And at the end of that scene, she does a 360 degrees and goes the other way. Jamie Jones plays the protagonist in the, the social worker in this play, Luna Gale, now at Aurora Theater Company in Berkeley. So Devin O'Brien, Jamie Jones, who plays a social worker, Laura Jane Bailey, who plays the baby's grandmother, they all appeared in another play you directed at the Aurora, a play called Mud Blue Sky. Why did you, or the casting director, invite these three actors back to work with you on this play? Uh, well, we don't really have a casting director at Aurora. Um, gotcha. We have me and, and Josh Costello who kind of figure all this stuff out. Um, when I read the script, I immediately thought of Jamie Jones. I mean, that was, so I got Jamie the copy of the script and said, do you want to do this? And she said, yes, it's brilliant. I want to do it. So then I started thinking about the different characters and I brought in Laura Jane and Devin. And I wasn't sure exactly how it was all going to play out. I wasn't trying to do something cute, but we had yeah done this Mud Blue Sky two seasons ago with one other actor, Rebecca Dines. Unfortunately, there was not a role for Rebecca Dines in this particular show. Um, and uh, it was about three flight attendants uh, nearing retirement who hook up with the one's a pot dealer in Chicago. And we just had the best I just had the best time with them. It was like an ensemble. I definitely wanted to work with all of them again. They all loved each other. And this brings to mind for me the issue of chemistry and chemistry on stage and chemistry in rehearsals. How important is chemistry to you? And also, what does it mean when you have actors who've worked very closely with each other in previous productions? Yeah. Well, I think chemistry is super important. 
I it's pretty rare for me to hire an actor just by watching them do an audition by themselves. I like to bring in people and mix and match people and see how they look together and how they respond to each other. Also, like when I brought Alex, who plays uh, Luna Gale's mother in, I didn't know her before, with and read with Devin. I mean, the chemistry between the two of them was just incredible. And um, so that's super important. I always say I don't want, I probably shouldn't say this on the radio, but, you know, if I'm going to hire people who are going to be lovers in some way, I want to actually believe that they'd actually want to go to bed together. <laughs> <laughs> so makes I, perfect sense. So that's chemistry. <laughs> So you have directed 26 productions for Aurora Theater Company. And, um, you know, after all these years of directing plays of all kinds, I, I imagine that you feel, you must feel like you're, you're getting better, that you're, you're improving, that you're maybe bringing in more ideas or more methods, or perhaps as artistic director at the Aurora Theater Company, you observe other directors in their rehearsals, and maybe you gather, harvest some ideas about what they're doing. Um, can you talk a little bit about your trajectory as a director and what you might be doing now that is different than what you might have been doing like 20 plays ago? That's a really good question. I haven't really ever thought of that exactly. Um, but I do think every play is a challenge because every play is different. Every cast is different. Sometimes people say, oh, that's a risky work or that's not so risky. But I, I think every work is risky because it's theater, it's live. You don't know how it's going to come together ultimately. You create a little family for three and a half weeks of usually people that don't know each other. And by the second or third day, you're talking about your sex lives or whatever because you got to go through all that stuff as actors around a mm. table. Um, so you create this wonderful little family and then nine weeks later it's over and everybody goes away. I remember that, I think it was a quote that Picasso said that I read a long time ago or something, and he said he was a great artist. He said, other people can paint what I paint, but I can make it look as good as they can with fewer brush strokes. And I think that, I think my process has gotten clearer. I think I'm clearer in talking to actors about what I'm looking for from them. I am not a director that deconstructs plays. I try to do what I think the playwright is aiming for. I don't try to impose my will on an actor. What I try to do is find out what the actor's feeling and experiencing and make sure that it's making sense in the world that I create. I create the world of the play on stage, but the actors have to create their own individual bubbles of what they're doing. I can never, I don't have that line memorized in my head. I'm not looking at it, that other actor in the eyes. Um, they are doing that, but I can see it from the outside. And I want to make sure that what they're doing on stage is what they believe in. And they're not just doing it because Tom told them to. And so I think I've gotten um, less egotistical about that you know, stuff and um, just clearer in my approach. And I also know our room so well. Because yes, I've not only directed 25 or 26 shows in that room or in that room or the same configuration at the City Club, but as artistic director, I'm with every other director during their previews, during their rehearsals, and I'm giving them notes as well. So I, I think I think my understanding of the deep thrust is uh, sometimes I want to do a proscenium show just to do something different. But I think I understand our space really well. And when you're trying to elicit something from an actor, are you telling that actor typically think about this or imagine that? Or is there some other way in which you try and nudge the actor in a direction that you want? Well, we start. We always start with a. I always start with a number of days of table work. That's where we just sit around with the script and we start breaking things down into little components, and start looking at it there in the early stages. Like, why is that character saying that? What is that chess move that character's just made? Why is that character reacting? Why is there a silence or a pause there? And we start going very, very deeply into that. So I think we usually start on the right foot to begin with. Um, I don't think I'm a method actor, director, that I'm saying invoke your, some horrible thing that happened to you when you were a child. Although I think some actors do that privately, but I don't impose that on them. Uh, I, we talk about the script and talk about what the playwright's writing there. And I think I've been really lucky. I've had a lot of great actors um, who know how to bring up the tears or know how to bring up the anguish or the pain without me telling them. Like I said, I, I'm actually protective of some of the actors in my current cast because I think that they're dredging up some really deep things and I don't want them hurting themselves. Mm. Now, you've directed many plays where 
the characters know each other, right? They're family members. They've interacted with each other over the course of many years. But here in Luna Gale, it's kind of a forensic process where the social worker who hasn't met these people before is meeting them and getting to know them and learning about them. And so there's a sort of sizing up of different people all along through this play. And I wonder how that might affect your job as director, that these are people who are largely unfamiliar to each other and they are kind of starting from ground zero and building a familiarity with each other as the play progresses. Well, when I start doing that table work, I don't have everybody sitting around the table together. I break them into smaller groups. So, for example, Devin and Alex, who play the, the parents of Luna Gale, who didn't know each other before they started working on this play, you know, I'll, I'll spend a couple hours just with them. And I, they create their backstories and t- they, they decide on their history together with, with me. So, you know, we work on it like that way. Then um, sometimes I, I'll, I'll have actors who don't really know each other in the play. They don't have to know the backstories of other people. I actually, and this, for this particular play, because the grandmother and the mother of Luna Gale absolutely do not get along. In fact, they are enemies in the play. I never had those two actors sit around the table together. Uh, Laura Jane met with... Kevin, who plays her pastor, and they talked about their backstories together, what her backstory was with her husband, who's left her, and all that kind of stuff. But I never had her and the daughter together because there was just no reason for that. Eventually, I would have Jamie, who plays like this detective social worker, I would have her maybe come in towards the end of their discussions when they kind of had formulated what their histories were, and then she could hear about some of that stuff. So I, I break them up into little little groups. And I don't think everybody has to know everything about every other character on stage. Luna Gale, it's a very interesting, inventive, provocative play by Rebecca Gilman, and you can see it at Aurora Theatre Company through October 1st. It's directed by my guest Tom Ross, who is also artistic director of Aurora Theatre Company. And for tickets and more information, you can visit Aurora Theatre with an R-E, Aurora Theatre, Dot org or call 510-843-4822, 510-843-4822. Their stage is located on Addison Street near Shattuck in downtown Berkeley. Tom, congratulations for this production and best wishes for the rest of the run. Thank you, C.S. This was fun. Thanks. And I'm C.S. Song on Bay Area Theater for KPFA.